In all the hurry and hustle and confusion of modern living, the Lord has a way. We believe that the Bible is God's revelation of his way. We invite you to join us for In Search of the Lord's Way with Mac Lyon. My friend, we're truly happy to welcome you to our program of Bible study in search of the Lord's way. We received a letter a few days ago from a hearing impaired person who views our program on television and then receives printed copies of the messages too, who has become a Christian. And then the next day or so, we received a letter from a man in Fort Worth, Texas, who sees the program and receives our audio cassette tapes. And he too has been baptized into Christ. Then right on the heels of those two, uh, one of our students enrolled in our Bible correspondence course wrote and asked us to send someone over. She wanted to be baptized. Well, there are others, of course. There are many, many others in the thousands of letters we receive who are blessed by these and uh, programs and in other ways that we minister to people. We appreciate your mail and your telephone calls. No, no, not for the money's sake, because our television and radio pro, uh, broadcasts and our tape ministry and our printing ministry and our Bible correspondence course and all that we do for people are not financed by viewers' response, but by churches of Christ with no strings attached. Thanks be to God for His church. All glory to Him in the church by Christ Jesus, world without end. All this year, we've been studying the Apostle Paul's inspiring and enlightening sermon on Mars Hill in the city of Athens. His whole sermon is about God. Oh, we've learned so much about God from what Paul taught there in Athens. In a society where even sometimes professed believers are guilty of trivializing God as we are in today's America, these studies have certainly been relevant. Today we'll complete the study of Paul's message and next week, God willing, we'll finish our series with a look at the Athenian response. I'm glad you're with us. We'll give today's program the title, The Power of His Resurrection. And once more, we'll read the sermon in its entirety as we have it in Acts chapter 17, verses 22 through 31. But first, Ken Heldbrand's going to lead us in praising God in song. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious or very religious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshiped with men's hands as though we needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life, breath, and all things, and has made of one blood all nation of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from everyone of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, 
as certain also of your own points have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think of the Godhead as like unto gold or silver or stone, and the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. Now let us pray. Almighty, all wise, and all loving God in heaven, we recognize you too as the Father of our spirits and we praise you as we approach you humbly in reverence and awe. But we thank you for your care, for the life that we live and the provisions that you've made for us. We recognize you as the source and the giver of all of life and the necessities of it. Father, we pray your continued blessings on us in our study today how we have enjoyed the study of Paul's Sermon on Mars Hill in anticipation of its leading us closer to you in our life for you. In the name of Jesus, who was resurrected from the dead, we pray. Amen. of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he is appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he hath given an assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. In that he has raised him from the dead. Did Paul really believe that Jesus Christ was raised bodily from the grave? Oh, yes, he did. You can be absolutely certain of it, my friend. In fact, it's been said, and correctly so, I think, that Saul's conversion is one of the strongest evidences we have of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some of his biographers think that since Saul was a student of Gamaliel's in Jerusalem at the time that Jesus was coming and going there, he was probably personally acquainted with Jesus and even heard him teach on occasion. He knew of Jesus' claims to deity, but he didn't believe him. He certainly knew of his crucifixion because he told Agrippa that the deed was not done in a corner or in seclusion. Everyone knew about it, he said. But Saul didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah of the Old Testament promise and prophecies as he claimed to be, and, and those prophecies with which he was so familiar. He knew, too, that the apostles and some of the other disciples had gone out preaching that Christ was raised from the dead the third day. But he considered all of that the rankest kind of heresy. And he was doing his utmost to put them to silence. When the Bible readers first introduced to Saul of Tarsus in the last paragraph of the, uh, Acts the, uh, chapter 7, he's doing just what we said. He is persecuting those who are teaching the resurrection of Jesus. He was a militant persecutor of Christians. 
Although he probably never cast a stone, he was the one chiefly responsible for the stoning of Stephen, uh, who was, is called the first Christian martyr. Luke wrote in Acts chapter 7, verses 54 through 58, that when the people heard what Stephen was saying about Jesus, that they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. This Saul is called Paul, who preached the great sermon in Athens. The fact that they laid their garments at his feet is an indication that he was their leader. And the eighth chapter opens with the statement that at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. There's a direct connection between the stoning of Stephen and this new wave of persecution that caused the new Christians to flee to other towns and cities for their very lives. And the inference is that Saul was deeply involved in that persecution, even leading it. He himself said in Acts chapter 26, verses 9 through 11, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which things I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison. And having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to, uh, uh, to death, I gave my voice against them, and I punished them all in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even to strange cities. Then the ninth chapter opens with the story of Saul's continued persecution of Christians, his vigorous pursuit of them to the cities to which they had fled. Here Luke says, and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near to Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a great light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks or the goads. He, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. He arose and went into the city, and after a three-day wait, which time he spent in fasting and prayer, a disciple of the Lord named Ananias came to him and said, Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 22, 16. And he was baptized immediately. And Luke the historian is quick to say in Acts chapter 9, verse 20, that straightway, meaning immediately, at once, he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. What a sudden and total change, a 180-degree turn. Saul the persecutor quickly became Paul the persecuted. He who persecuted Jesus as an imposter and a heretic, he now preaches that he is the Son of God. Why? What was the evidence so convincing as to change Saul's belief that beyond any doubt whatsoever, Jesus Christ, whom he was so vigorously persecuting, was really and truly the Son of God, so that he would go now and preach him in the synagogues of the Jews, and yes, suffer the sting of their bitter 
persecution, even to death if necessary. What was it, I ask you? Well, there was just one thing that powerful and that convincing. Was it Jesus' claims to being the Son of God? He had made such claims, you know, as is written in John chapter 10, verse 36, again chapter 11, verse 4, chapter 19, verse 7, and other such passages. Saul, a student in the school of the great Rabbi Gamaliel, would have known that and surely would have considered it. But that wasn't what convinced him. Well, it was in our Lord's miracles that had persuaded him to be a believer. Oh, he must have known about these things. They were so open and they were so prominent that many people were astounded by them and became believers in him. They were convincing. That was the primary purpose of Jesus' miracles. But that wasn't what changed Saul's mind about Christ. Could it have been the powerful preaching of the apostles by the Holy Spirit, such as Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost? Saul was a devout Jew. He must have been in Jerusalem for the pe feast of Pentecost when the apostle Peter declared, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you, by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God has raised up. Acts 2, 22, 24. Therefore, he continued, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Many of them, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or the forgiveness of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, the number being about 3,000. But Saul was not one of them. Well, what was it then that was so persuasive as to move Saul to say of himself, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, touching righteousness which is in the law blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, the power of his resurrection. Yes, that was it. That was what changed Paul's mind. Paul saw Christ on the Damascus road and was fully, absolutely, totally convinced that he was not just theoretically or theologically, but indeed and in reality raised from the dead bodily. In all of Paul's preaching, not just accommodating crowd teasing Easter Sunday preaching, but always his theme was Christ died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead. And when he was arrested for such teaching and brought before the council, his defense was simple. It is for the hope of the resurrection of the dead I am called in question, he said in Acts 23. And again, before Governor Felix, he boldly denied all charges except it be for this one voice, he said, that I cried standing among them touching the resurrection of the dead. I am called in question by you this day. 
And now, here in Athens, over in Greece, to the men who trusted in their worldly wisdom, he's still preaching the resurrection. Wasn't popular with the Jewish sect of the Sadducees. They had him in prison. It was a repulsive thought, totally unacceptable with the Greeks. But Paul preached it nonetheless. Oh, that all men might know the power of Christ's resurrection to turn men's lives around as evidenced by Paul's own experience. So he wrote in that great dissertation on the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how does some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. But now, he says, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who sleep. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ's at his coming. What a great promise. What a precious hope of life beyond the grave. What a powerful motivation to a godly life. Our Father who art in heaven, we are so grateful to you that through Jesus Christ we have this inspiring and encouraging and motivating hope because Jesus was raised in reality from the day. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Paul's conversion and his unshakable confidence in the resurrection of Christ from the grave bodily are powerful evidences of that fact. Paul saw Christ after his resurrection. Therefore, there was no convincing him that Christ was not raised. His belief in the Lord's resurrection was the forceful motivation behind his sacrifice of everything that's important to most people, and they were important to Paul also. But there's something else that simply must be said about the power of his resurrection. Faith in the resurrection of Christ gives meaning to baptism in becoming a Christian. Without a strong faith in the resurrection of Jesus, baptism is but a cold ritual. And that's one very big reason many people deride and even mock and even reject baptism as a part of regeneration. Peter addressed that problem in his first epistle. He's talking about Noah and the others who were saved by the flood from the destruction of the old world. And he says, a few, that is eight persons, 
were brought safely through the water, and corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after uh, angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. That's the New American Standard Version, chapter 3, verses 20 through 22. Peter makes it clear that baptism is not merely a washing of the physical body, but it's clearly an appeal to God for a good conscience, an appeal to God for forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Not on its own merits. No, no, a thousand times no. It's an appeal to God for a good conscience or salvation on the merits of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, that's one reason Paul, when he was told by Ananias to arise and be baptized, and wash away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord, had no quibble about it. Because of his faith, his absolute, unfailing faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he was baptized at once. How about you, my friend? If we may assist you, please call on us. We're friends of yours in churches of Christ. We're not here to exploit you in any way, but to help. Therefore, if you've heard me say it before, well, I'm sure you have, we'd like to come by your house and study the Bible with you or help you with other needs. We won't be doing it without your invitation. If you'd like to contact us for our tapes or transcripts or Bible correspondence course or for any other reason, don't be afraid someone will come knocking on your door unless you give us an invitation or permission to send them. A free printed copy or audio cassette tape of this message may be obtained simply by requesting the program titled The Power of His Resurrection. Mail your request to In Search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma, 73083, or by email at searchtv at aol.com. You won't need to send money because it's free a gift from your friends in Churches of Christ. Our toll-free telephone number for this purpose is 1-800-321-8633. Let us hear from you this week and say, we'd love to have you worship with us too, would you? If you need help locating us in this area, please call. We plan to be back next week at the same time. We hope you will too. God bless you now. We love you.